going to start with angels we have heard on high. Because this is the place where you can come as you are. This is the place where it's okay to not be okay. And sometimes we just aren't, right? Yeah. But I want you to know we're on mission. And it is our hope and our prayer to help people discover a relationship with Jesus, but also go deeper in their relationship with Jesus. And we hope that in this hour, that is what you experience this morning. Please pray with me. Heavenly Father, we need a Savior. We need the babe from Bethlehem to grow up and bring hope and reconciliation where life is broken and hurting. As we just sang, come and see, come and see the babe. Thank you, Lord, for the one who came, who came to be bright and to become the light of the world. We need the peace that can only come from this one who then went to the cross and died for our sins. Help us this morning to behold not only the miracle of the birth of Jesus, but the miracle of new life that he brings to us every single day. Oh, Heavenly Father, our hearts are also thinking about those we know and love who are struggling, who need encouragement, who need hope. 
We pray for the Gaddis family in the loss of Laura's father and in the services that they had together yesterday. Lord, wrap your loving arms around this precious family. We also pray for Catherine and Keebler Strads in the loss of David and ask that you would walk with him in these days without him. Oh, Lord, we pray for Julie Atkinson's father who fell last week and for whom she is caring for this weekend. Lord, help her to help her father get back on his feet and be strengthened. We pray for Lori and Dan Parks as they care for all of their parents who are struggling with all kinds of medical issues. And for Alicia Elliott's mother-in-law, recently diagnosed with breast cancer, with upcoming surgery next in the next couple of weeks, bless her with the cleansing and refreshing of her body completely healed. Oh, Lord, we also lift up the two sets of twins that Keely Lynn is caring for at Tampa General Hospital who are struggling. We pray that they would thrive and grow. Lord, all these things are opportunities for us to just lean into you and trust you more as we pray for those we love. And we ask, oh God, that you would help us to leave this place filled up by the power of your Holy Spirit. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. We have the privilege this morning of being reminded that God came into our world. It is the mystery of the incarnation. God became a man and lived among us. He let go of all the prerogatives of being in the Trinity in heaven, the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, and he humbled himself by becoming a man and being born in a stable to be bright, to be the light of the world. So, friends, as I light this candle this morning, the two first candles of Advent, and as I'm assisted by someone, <laughs> it worked a minute ago, and Jesus is the light of the world, whether this works. Yay, thanks, Dina. That one and this one. As she lights that candle, the reason we have these candles is a reminder to us all to be bright, to go into the world in the same way that Jesus came into our world. And notice, he didn't wait for us to come to him. He, he made sure that he came to us first. So friends, we are being sent to be bright in the world, to go into those relationships, to be present. Not perfect, present. Amen. We now have the privilege, thank you, we now have the privilege of celebrating the dedication of a precious and beautiful baby boy, Theo Jonas Spendris. And I want to invite Tad and Gita Spendris to come forward with little Theo, but also with them are all kinds of wonderful family members that we want to welcome. Lithuanians. Yes. Kathy butchered their last name. I think it's pronounced Vendries. Oh. All this time. Okay. How do I do? How do I do, Ed? Did I get that? A linguist. Vendries. Okay. Thank you for that. Anytime. Yeah. I want to welcome all the grandparents. And we have Edward. We have Lima. We have Violetta. And we have all kinds of aunts and uncles and cousins and friends. We are so thankful. Please stand so that we can welcome you this morning. Yes. And we also have members of their life group that they participate in. Aaron and Dan Carlson lead the group, but others are here. If you're in their life group, we want you to come forward and be a part of this moment. So wherever you're seated, come on up right now. And they participate in this life group for the ongoing nurture of their, some of you stood up and you sat back down, I'm not sure why, but come on up. Come on up and come around and come up with the family. Yeah. So here's what we're doing. If you'll notice on the wall, it says, let's go back to the sign if you wouldn't mind. It says infant dedication. So what is not happening this morning is we're not baptizing Theo. Theo, by the way, is the, from Lithuanian over to English. You know what it means in Greek? You know what it means in Greek? God. Theos is the, is the Greek word for God. Did you know that? <laughs> and he's saying Theodore, and the D-O part of it means gift from God, right? So if his full name is Theodore, then the D-O is the Greek root for giving. Sorry about the linguistic lesson here this morning. 
Here's what we're doing. He's giving. Jinta is giving this child to God. But we're not, we're not baptizing the baby. You are going to agree after Kathy asks you in a few minutes to help these parents as a family of faith raise this boy so when he's of age, he's going to decide for himself that he wants to be a follower of Jesus. And then you know what we're going to do after that? We're going to baptize that young man. That's what we're going to do. You can still, right now today, reaffirm your commitment to Jesus Christ. And you can reaffirm your commitment to be a part of the body of Jesus Christ that helps all of us on a daily basis reaffirm our faith. But for some of us who begin brand new in faith, baptism of which is a sign that we have started a life of faith with Jesus. This mom and dad were baptized as adults as fathers of Jesus, followers of Jesus. And they want their son Theo to have that same opportunity. That's what's going on this morning. And Kathy is going to help lead us now. Yes, thank you. So Vita and Tad, as you present little Theo this morning to be dedicated to God, do you promise to teach Theo about Jesus and to read scripture to him, pray with him and for him? If so, say we will with God's help. We will with God's help. And I want to ask all of you, your life group members and all of us sitting here this morning, representing the whole Church of Christ, Will you promise to come alongside the Sven Rees family so that one day as you nurture faith in this little one, as you teach him in vacation Bible school and pray for him, so that one day Theo will be able to say that Jesus is his Lord and Savior. If so, say we will. So can I take it? Friends, we dedicate this sweet little one, Theo Jonas Fendris, to God. He belongs to God. And he is God's gift, not only to this family, but to all of us, right? Say amen if you know that with all of your heart. Yes. And so I'm going to bring little Theo down this aisle. Just saying that we now have the privilege of raising him up so that he will learn about Jesus and be a follower like his mom and dad and his grandparents and aunts and uncles. And all of us have this fabulous, wonderful privilege of helping him grow in faith and life. And I pray that the mystery and the blessing of his dedication only draws your hearts closer to Jesus in this moment. All God's people said, amen. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Welcome. Congratulations.
Good morning. We have just a few things we want to share with you. First of all is the Connect cards. They're actually in the pews, and if you're new and you are willing, please let us know that you're here. We would love to help welcome you and make you feel right at home. But we'd also love the opportunity to pray for you or help you get into a life group, whatever it is you indicate on the card. And you can put them in the uh, baskets when they go around later. Next, we have Next. And I love this moment. It's an opportunity right after this worship service with child care provided for me to be able to meet with you in the office for just a few minutes. And in those moments, we will talk about the mission and vision of the church, but also how you can connect and engage. And we also want to give you the gift of helping you figure out how God has built you. And we're going to help you even do the Enneagram or Enneagram, however you pronounce that. Another linguistic problem. Yeah, 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 for sure. I need to work on that one as well. And so we just want, we want to pour into you even as we kind of let you know about who we really are. And some of you might be surprised even if you've been in worship for a long time. Come check us out. You might discover some new things. This is so cool. You probably saw the angel tree out front when you came in, and perhaps you grabbed one. When worship started, we still had eight, uh, 12 left. These are foster children, and they provided a wish list of things that they would love to receive for Christmas. And these, of course, are children who are at risk. And we want to be a church that just loves on them well. Thank you to all who have participated, but wouldn't it be so cool if every angel tree uh, little flyer was taken off that tree by the time we leave here this morning? Just think about it, pray about it, and see if that's something you would like to do for a child. And I have three quick announcements to pass along to you. The first one is next Sunday at 11 o'clock in this room. The choir that sings at 11 o'clock every Sunday is doing the Christmas portion of one of the greatest pieces of music ever written, Handel's Messiah. If you would like to hear Handel's Messiah, the Christmas portion, and hear it done really well, hang around next Sunday and stay through until 11 o'clock and hear it. It's going to be awesome. Next thing I want to tell you is this is Christmas. I don't know if you knew it. It's the Christmas season, and one of the things that happens in our world is that people want to go to church on Christmas Eve. We have two services. One is at 3 o'clock. One is at 5 o'clock on the 24th. And we're giving you a chance today to take home with you a yard sign. The yard signs will be out there. And what that means is if you put the yard sign out, people might ask you about it. Here's what you really need to know. People will come, 65% of them will say yes, who otherwise wouldn't be in a church, if you will invite them. And on Christmas Eve, we're going to do our very best to worship Jesus, but also be invitational going forward into 2020. So we want to make you aware, yard signs begin today. We have X number of them. When they're gone, they're gone. We'd love for you to be fighting over them out there so you can't wait to get home and put them someplace strategic on, in your neighborhood. The last thing is you are today being invited, whether you have a child involved or not, to go upstairs because at 11 o'clock, Rachel Godin, the director of children's ministry, is leading your children in a presentation called Mary and Bright. It's what we do annually, and we're doing it upstairs. It starts at 11. We're going to have milk and cookies for you after it's over. Your child, if you are here right now today and your child has never been in the building before, even that child has a part that Rachel is making convenient and easy for that child to participate. So after worship today, you don't need to do anything else. Just meander up down the hallway, up the stairs, or use the elevator, which is right here through the gap. Either way, to the second floor, you can hear the sound of the music at the end of the hallway, Mary and Bright, our Christmas presentation of our children with Rachel Godin, our children's ministry director. Friends, we've clearly been given the gift of children. And in the context of our church, we've had 120 children engaged in the life of this church. And you and I have been given the responsibility by God to care for them so that they might come to know Jesus, just like we talked about with little Theo. And so as a result of your generosity, they're hearing the gospel. And there are at least 140 on the rolls of our church, so we haven't gotten to every child yet, but with your help, we will. So I want to thank you that because of your willingness to share what God has given to you, we are able to reach every little one for Jesus. That is something to celebrate as the baskets go around.
It's December 8th. It means we're in the middle of Christmas. If you notice, the place is decorated. The lights, it's like, I, I, I'm just telling you, I love it. I, I want you to know how much I love it. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. We got style points here. I, I want to walk over to the Advent wreath. Kathy used a fancy word. And this, this is sort of going to be this Christmas, the series of things we're talking about may be as unusual as you've ever been a part of during the season of Christmas. Advent, it's an English word sort of talking about the coming and the expectation of God coming in the birth of the child. But she used another really fancy word. She used the word incarnation. So one of the things you're getting this morning is a really good dose of really meaty Christian thinking. Incarnation. It's the way that those of us who've had formal training, and some of you who haven't had the formal training, it's a way to express what we mean when we say God became a human being. And then at Christmas we say Emmanuel, and it was in O Come, O Come, Emmanuel. We're hoping that God will come. And so this word, I want you to leave here this morning saying, I, I in my mind and working through my being, is this idea that God came to us. There's a sense in which God, in the mystery of the Godhead of the Trinity, that's the second mystery we're not going to think about very much this morning. It's a great one, but really two great mysteries, Trinity, Incarnation. They're related, obviously. And so God said, I think I'm going to send myself to them because they need help. We need help. Man, did we get it. So the, the word incarnation is a, a fancy way to say God loves us so much that God set aside the privileges and the prerogatives of the Godhead. Now that's back to the mystery of Trinity. You with me? We okay? Trinity incarnation. Trinity incar God says, you know what? I'm going to voluntarily, in some sense of part of who I am, Father, Son, and Spirit, I'm going to become one of them. I'm sending myself to them. Why? Because they need help. They need to be rescued from their own rebellion against me. They have not chosen to surrender to me, to love me, and there's all kinds of junk, and I'm going to repair the junk. How? The life, the death, and the resurrection of myself slash my son. And so we celebrate the incarnation at Christmas, because that's what, when it got started. But man, the punchline is Easter. It's the resurrection. So that's what this is all about. Now, yes, Christmas is about lights and it's about music and it's about eating way too much sugar. Can can I get that? Is it like can you have you already started on your sugar binge? Have you? I binged hard on sugar on this past Friday. Yesterday, I gave one of these. Had all kinds of opportunity. Kathy made this unbelievable creme de mint chocolate chip pie last night. And I went, nope, get behind me, Satan. And don't push. Incarnation. That's what we're about. And so what we're trying to understand for the Sundays of Advent, December 1, December 8, December 15, December 22, and on Christmas Eve, December 24, that God said, I'm going in. And that's what that's about. I'm going in. God sent himself to you and to me. And guess what? Friends, we, you, I, we're God's plan A to get to Tampa. That's the deal. That's what you're going to hear on Sunday mornings at First Presbyterian Church in two or three different ways over the course of last week, this week, next week, etc. You and I, we're plan A. And guess what? There ain't no plan B. God sent self, and then you and I get made into new people by the indwelling Jesus in us. And guess what? Sent. You know what you're sent to do? Here's one way of summarizing it. Be a good friend. Where? Where I live and where I work and where I have fun, where I study. That's where we do it. You've been sent into your job. You've been sent in your family. You've been sent into your neighborhood. You and I, we're plan A, and there is no plan B. How are they 
going to know that God said, I'm coming if we don't go and tell them. And the way you tell them is you love them well. You're a good friend, a normal friend, a regular friend, an authentic friend. Where in your business, in your home, in your neighborhood, with the families who are doing youth sports with you, even where you do regular business with the folks that help you, that's where we go. The world is not outside those doors waiting to get in. See, we, weren't, we didn't go to God and say, please come get us. Matter of fact, we went the other direction. And so what God says, I'm fixing it. I love them so much. I'm going in. There's a silly scene in the movie. Well, I guess it may be, you may not agree with me, it may be the greatest Christmas movie ever made in the history of cinematography. You ready? What are you going to guess? I hear several. Christmas Vacation! Yes! <laughs> yes, I am that shallow and immature. And here's the scene in it. It's late in the movie, and they're in Chevy Chase's, Clark Griswold's living room, and the first tree got burned up by the grandpa who smoked a cigar, and the second tree's in there, and there's a squirrel in it. Squirrel! And they all leave, the grandma falls over, faints, and they all go in the back room. And Chevy Chase gets a bag and a hammer. <laughs> and he says... I'm, I, what, and his wife says, what are you going to do? I said, she says, I'm going to get it. And he starts into the room, and his dad behind him says, like, there was some, like it was a till of the hun, I'm going in with him. We're going in with him. Guess what? Jesus has already left the building. He's out there. And if you want to be with him, you've got to go in with him. I want to go in with him. You know what else I want? I want to be a part of a tribe a family that wants to go. That's what we're studying this morning. So here's what I want us to do. I, I feel like you're saying, wait a minute, I, I'm not doing that. I, I don't, I don't. Here's what you aren't. You're not a professional Christian. Guess who is? I went to seminary. I can tell you the Greek root of the word theo. I can tell you theodore means the gift of God. Because the D.O. is the root of the Greek word to give. Do you need to know that? No. You know what you need to know? That you are loved and your life is different. And you need to know that you can be a good friend. And you need to know that there are people who you care about. It may be that Tuesday morning you're in a meeting and you are the only person from this church or from any church who is a follower of Jesus in that meeting. And that's where God wants you. And you do your job as good as you can do it because there's a door there. And if you're willing to walk through it and take the risk, God will give you not only the relationship but the opportunity to talk. And you're not better than anybody, but what you are is rescued. Oh, you reflect on how you've been rescued, and then you have something to say. Because you know what? You want everybody who you care about to experience the same thing. And that's what we're going to see in the Apostle Paul. So we're going to read a long piece of Scripture, but I'm not going to talk long on it. So you can relax. It's real long. But I'm not going to talk long about it. I'm not going to do any Greek. How's that? I know that you don't love Greek. I love Greek, and I just, if you, if you want to love Greek with me, come tell me we'll love it together. Here is the Apostle Paul writing a letter to the Christians the followers of Jesus in the city of Corinth. Corinth is in Greece. It's a long way from Paul's background. It's not full of Jewish people, which is what Paul is. It's full of non-Jewish people. They don't, these people have no idea, most of them, what the Jewish thing is about. But they've begun to respond to Jesus. And here's the other important thing you need to know. There are other people out representing Jesus who are saying that Paul is not legit. And one of the reasons they say is because Paul was not one of the guys running around with Jesus before Jesus' resurrection. Now, Paul meets Jesus after the resurrection, and Paul's going to say, and he's right, oh, yeah, I'm very legit. But he's getting accused of being not legit. And here is where we pick up with the story. What Paul's going to try to say is, I can impose my rights, R-I-G-H-T-S, on all of you people in the church of Corinth to be a, pay my bills because Paul, like me, could have imposed on them, I'm a professional Christian, and not only do you have to listen to me, you've got to give me money so I don't have to work. I can do my job full time, right? Paul is saying to them, others, you're funding the others, but you're telling me you, should, you don't have to fund me because I'm not legit. 
Here's where it goes. We're going to read uh, 23 verses. Am I not free? Am I not an apostle? Have I not seen Jesus our Lord? Of course, all of those are Are you not the result of my prayer? The Lord answers yes. Even though I may not be an apostle to others, that is the detractors, this early I am to you. For you are the seal of my apostleship in the Lord. This is my defense to those who sit in judgment on me. Don't we have the same right to food and drink? You see what Paul is saying is, you as the church, I have every right to ask you to cover my living expenses. This is what we're going to see for several little paragraphs. I have every right to ask you to cover my living expenses, says Paul, because I'm just as legitimate as anyone else. Don't we have the right to take a believing wife along with us, as do the other apostles and the Lord's brother and Cephas? Cephas means Peter. Or is it only I and Barnabas who lack the right to not work for a living? In other words, Paul has his partner Barnabas, and apparently people were saying those two don't deserve, they're not legit, so you don't need to take care of their expenses. Right? So that's what's going on here. Next, the next slide. And so he's using metaphors here. Who serves as a soldier at his own expense? Nobody. Who plants a vineyard and does not eat its grapes? Nobody. Who tends a flock and does not drink the milk? Nobody. Do I say this merely on human authority? Doesn't the law say the same thing? For it's written in the law of Moses. Don't muzzle an ox while it's trading out the grain. In other words, feed it. Is it about an ox that God is concerned? Surely he says this for us too, doesn't he? Paul again making his argument that I am legit and I work for you and I could if I wanted to and all right expect you to pay my living expenses. And we keep going with argument. Yes, this was written for us because whoever plows and threshes should be able to do so in the hope of sharing in the harvest. If we have sown spiritual seed among you, is it too much if we reap a material harvest from you? And of course the answer, no, it wouldn't be. If others have this right of support from you, shouldn't we have it all the more? 12B, great punchline. Next, the next slide. But look at what Paul says. But... We did not use this right. It's a team effort. Paul gets a lot of the publicity, but he's always working with the team. On the contrary, we put up with anything rather than hinder the gospel of Jesus. In other words, I could ask you and insist, and I'll buy all rights you would be obligated, but I ain't going to do it because I care way more about communicating the truth of the good news of Jesus to you. So all he goes in his, distance, in his, uh, his thinking. Don't you know that those who serve in the temple get their food from the temple? And yes, they do. And that those who serve at the altar share what's offered on the altar? They do. They got to eat the animals that were burned partially on altars. In the same way, the Lord has commanded that those who preach the gospel should re receive their living from the gospel. In other words, those of us who are professionals should be able to live off of the gifts that people who are part of the family of faith give to the family of faith. But, I've not used any of these rights, and I'm not writing this in the hope that you will do such things for me. For I would rather die than allow anyone to deprive me of this boast. For when I preach the gospel, I cannot boast since I'm compelled to preach. Woe to me if I do not preach. I've got to do my job. I've got to do what God made me to do. Not all of us are preachers in this room right now, but all of us have jobs. All of us have families. All of us have been sent. Paul is sent. He's doing the part he's supposed to do. You're being I, and I'm being asked to do my part, what I'm supposed to do. If I preach voluntarily, I have a reward. If not voluntarily, I'm simply discharging the trust committed to me. What then is my reward? So let me tell you what Paul did. He refused to even ask for help so that he could not be in the way of people here. You know what he did? He visited with people to talk about Jesus all day, and you know what he did at night? Made tents. Made tents with his hands. Hard work. Nicks, holes, sore shoulder. Over and over and over and over and over again. Throughout all of his journeys all around the eastern Mediterranean, northern Mediterranean, he never once imposed his right to be supported by the people he was bringing good news to. He made a living externally. That's where we're headed. Next slide, please, sir. This is the last, this is the last slide, and we're going to see this, this text again in a different translation just to help us understand it. Look carefully at what Paul is saying, and we're coming to the punchline. Though I am free and belong to no one, 
I've made myself a slave or another translation, a servant to everyone to win as many as possible. Paul was sent. Jesus was sent. You and I are sent. And we become servant leaders in our jobs. We become servant leaders in our families. We become servant leaders in Little League. We take an interest in other people. We learn to care about what other people care about because that builds a bridge as a friend in order to share real life together, including what's happened to me inside because I became a follower of Jesus. You can do that. You don't need seminary. You don't need to be a professional Christian, but you can be a good friend. And that's what Paul is saying. A fantastic tent maker, so his tent sold, so he was free to do what God made him to do. A, un a unique man, but the, the principles work for all of us. To the Jews, I became like a Jew to win the Jews. What that means is, is when he was with his people, the Jewish people, he conducted himself so as to not offend them. I'll use a funny illustration. When Paul was hanging out in Corinth with Jewish people, he did not smack on ribs. Maybe some of you don't understand what that means. The Jewish people won't eat pork. Paul knows that it's fine to eat pork. When he was with non-Jewish people in Corinth, I'm reckoning he ate ribs. But why would you eat a rib in front of your brothers and sisters who you're trying to tell about Jesus when you know that the eating of a rib is going to block them from hearing anything else you ever say? So it wasn't against the rules. He wasn't living by rules. He was living to love people. He, he surrendered his right to smack on ribs so that he could tell people who were followers of Jesus, who were also, their backgrounds were Jewish, so he could show them Jesus and not get hung up in the details about these food rules. Nothing wrong with the food rules, but they're not what rescues us. What rescues Paul, what rescues you and me is Jesus. So he says, I'm, to those under the law, that is the Jewish law, all the rules, I became like one of them, though I'm not under the law. He's really clear about that. Who he's under is, he's a servant of Jesus. So as to win those under the law, to those not having the law, I became like one not having the law, though I am not free from God's law, but am under Christ's law. What that means is, when I was with people who weren't a part of the Jewish family, which is most people on the planet, I, I am still free to do what I want as long as I'm not violating some kind of huge condition, some kind of rule, some kind of really clear uh, uh, ethical thing. I'll give you a silly illustration. I used to work with teenagers in a mission called Young Life, and we would joke and say, we'd get a lot more teenagers to come on Monday Night Young Life up if we just had a keg there. But see what I did there. You, do you see the, the point? Yeah. You know, you're getting in trouble pretty good if you violate a huge, obvious ethical problem. That's a problem. So, no, we didn't use unethical things in order to work with teenagers. And I'm not asking you to do unethical things in order to win someone's friendship because some things are just right and some things are wrong. So don't do wrong things. Do right things. But those, you're not under these rules unless the rule is really clear. So that's what Paul is saying here. I, when I'm around people that don't know anything about Judaism, I'm free to eat ribs if I want to. I'm not going to bring a keg in, however. So as to win those, the other half. There's Jewish people and there's not Jewish people. And Paul's saying, I, watch what's happening next. I'm going to be all things to all people. Why? To the weak, I became weak. To the win the weak, I become all things to all people so that by all possible means, I might save some. I do this for the sake of the gospel so I can share in its blessings. I told you I wasn't going to talk about Greek or anything, and I'm not. There you have it. I wanted you to see this last paragraph in a different translation because it's kind of fun to see it in a paraphrase. This is called the message, this translation. So I'm going to turn and read that for you. Even though I'm free of the, man, the demands and expectations of everyone, I have voluntarily become a servant to any and all in order to reach a wide range of people. Now, look at his categories. This is really good. Religious people, non-religious people, meticulous moralists, those that would really crush you if you ate on those ribs and didn't wash your hands right for loose-living immoralists, See, Paul would be really comfortable in almost any setting you can imagine. Just go to Friday night and think. Paul would be comfortable there because he knows he's the son of the living king. Jesus would have been there first on Friday night. Wherever they are, that's where Jesus would be. The defeated, 
to demoralize whoever. God sent his son into all of those environments. And God sent Paul into all of those environments. And God sends you and me in all those environments. And I don't go in there because I got something special. It's not about me. It's about me having been rescued by the king of the universe. You having been rescued by the king. You have something now. You may have been in one of those places. Maybe you were a meticulous moralist. Maybe you were non-religious. Maybe you were a loose living immoralist. And if you got rescued by Jesus, you're different. And when you go back in, you know the way out. You know how to get out of there because you were there and now you're not. And let me, this, this principle is so important what I'm about to say. The goal here is not for us to gather and get a bunch of stuff and just stay together. Oh, no. This is a refueling stop. When you're meeting in your life group, you recover, you heal everything in that group, but it's a refueling stop. Oh, yes. Go. We're going in. That's where we're going. Out there. Where they are, where folks who have these kinds of ask, ask, uh, dynamics in their life. So keep continuing to read. I didn't take on their way of life because I I have bearings in Jesus. So if their way of life was outside of the guardrails of what I know is good and right and true and of God, then I don't start doing that stuff. But I go with them. It's not about being perfect, friends. It's about being present. See, God said, "I'm going to go be present with them." And you and I get to do it, too. You don't have to be perfect. You just have to be there. Be there. Be a normal friend. And that's what Paul's doing here. I've become just about every sort of servant there is in my attempts to lead those I meet into a God-saved life. Wow. Laser sharp. Focus. Shot out of a cannon. Clear. I did all of this because of the message. That means because of the gospel, because of the good news, because of Jesus. I didn't just want to talk about it. I wanted to be in on it. That's what I want to be a part of. I want to be a part of a big old group of people like you who want to be in on it. That's what I want to be. I want, I want to be a person that God uses to help other people discover Jesus. Just a couple of, I, this morning when I was preparing, I got moved. And I got moved because I'm getting moved again right now. There are five or six or seven people I care about a lot who are part of my life who are never in this building. I encounter them, and I don't want to talk about where I see them because I don't want to expose who they might be. But there are people who I am building a bridge of friendship and genuine. I really care about them. And I'm looking for a way to talk to them not only about whatever is important to them, but I want to also get a chance to talk about who I am. I'll give you an example. This is a person for whom I am a customer, a regular customer. And we were having a conversation recently, and it was a really good conversation because this person is in the middle of some challenges in business that I could sort of relate to in the challenges of my job, and we were going back and forth. And, and what I said was, man, you've got you to keep your eye on the ball because the world is changing so fast, and this person's industry has changed. If you think church industry hasn't changed, oh, my goodness, it's really hard. It's really hard to do this in a way that wins people who are distant Really hard. It's really good, but it's really hard. And we were kicking it around, and we said, yeah, it really changes fast. And I, this is what I said. This is a person who knows who I am and what I do. I said, yeah, but there's one thing that doesn't change, and that is the never-ending love of the Almighty God. Well, that is just another plank in the bridge that I'm building. This person knows that I'm not going to be offended and bat them over the head or anything, and I'm going to see this person again and again and again. Now, recently I also had one blow up on me, but I'm not going to go into that one right <laughs> This is another person of whom, for whom I am a regular customer, and I, I took a shot in there and it went boo. <laughs> so what I'm saying to you is awkward? Absolutely. I want you to think about God who really isn't vulnerable. Still, however, God took risk. And God's risk was, will they love me in response? Well, see, that's left up to us. That's the beauty of Tadas and Jinta 
as they present their kid to be dedicated. Theo will one day, and they will be praying that he will, that he will respond. But see, God gave that baby boy to them, but it's up to that baby boy to choose to respond. It's a risk being a parent. It's a risk being a person who's a follower of Jesus, who's willing to say, I'm going back in on Monday and Tuesday. And that's where the action is, friends. It's in your job, isn't it? That's where it really is. And this is, I said this to you last week, I'm saying it again. You want to know how to build bridges where you're a real friend or a real colleague of people? Do your job as best you can. It builds a natural entree into a meaningful conversation. And somewhere in there, if you'll take the risk, like I did, to say something like, wow, all this other stuff changes, but God's love never changes. There's a person in the room who is a friend. It doesn't matter whether you have a job or you get a paycheck or not, by the way. If you're a person whose job is taking care of a family, oh, do you not know that families are watching? Mom, mostly. If you're a stay-at-home mom, do your job so well. It's a, it's a hard job, and you're vulnerable. But do it really well and talk with other moms and dads about how to do it. And you know what's going to happen? The other families who are not a part of a life of faith, they want to do their family well. And when they can sense that you're on to something, they're going to want in. And it would be impossible you for you not to talk about how you're integrating your faith in your family. This is vital. Half of the people we're going to reach as a family of faith, as First Presbyterian Church, half of them are families with children. That's our strategy. That's what's going on. And guess what? That's where you live. You live where there's lots of people with families with children. And when you do that really well, you're creating a natural, obvious bridge so that we can be people who love each other well, but we love them well. And we're always patient and looking for ways to do it better. So this person in the room has a friend who is struggling with infertility. An infertility issue was with a friend who the person in the room is a follower of Jesus and knew that the, infer- the, uh, the infertility struggle wasn't. And the, so the person in the room took a risk and said, how have you seen God in this? It's just the introduction. Into, so now there's a new layer in the bridge, a new board, so you can walk on that one as well. So who knows where that's going to come out? Maybe this person struggling with infertility will feel cared about and maybe to begin to initiate some conversation, maybe another will happen. Who knows? It's a marathon. It's not a sprint. Relationships don't happen overnight. So I wanted to say that. Say I wanted to say to you two things, sort of to, to finish, if I could. They're printed on your bulletin here. In order to influence culture, we have to infiltrate or go into it. What I mean by that is this. In order to influence your job, in, in order to influence your family, your company, your neighborhood, your friendships, the things you do recreationally in youth sports and other youth activities, in order to be an influence, you got to dig in. You just go. And you know what you do? You listen. You find out what people care about. You find out what people are interested in. You find out where people are struggling. And then you become a regular friend. You can't influence people if you're not investing in them. And so you're, here's, the, here's the prayer. Here's a prayer God cannot wait to answer. You ready? Just, just one person. All you have to do is say, God, use me in the life of a person. You ask that prayer, God is just going, yeah, can't wait to answer it. I mentioned that I had five or six. You might, you might have five or six. One of them might be your spouse. One of them might be one of your children or your parent. There you are. You're just like Paul. I'll do whatever it takes. The other thing I want to say is you can't influence people without investing in them. And the second thing I wanted to say is this, and I'm, I'm repeating this. I've said it once, and I'm saying it again intentionally. This is not about us coming into this room or into our life groups or whatever we do to get stuff. This is about us getting healthier and more like what Jesus wants to be so we can go out there and be bright. This is about you being bright. Look at him. Bye, Theo. Spotlight child. See, I, my money's on Theo. Here's what I think is going to happen with Theo. I think Theo is going to get raised by parents that love Jesus. 
and raised by friends of the parents that love Jesus and raised by you. And one day Theo is going to say, I'm in. He's going to surrender to Jesus. He's going to learn. He's going to grow. He's going to get taught things. And he's going to help other people. And here's what he's going to do. He's going in. Because see, his mom and his dad go in. They're already showing how to do it. It's how they are. And that, so it's not about us collecting as much light as we can. It's not about me getting as much as I can. That's not it. Sure, we get healed and we, get, we learn and we grow, but it's about us joining the mission. I'm going in, and I want you to want to go in. I want to be a part of a team. It's a team thing. I want us to go in. And I'll listen and help you, and you can listen and help me, and you can pray for the people that I'm talking about who I want to reach, and God uses me to reach, and I'll pray for you, and we can work on it together, and we can learn clever ways to talk. We can help each other. But it's a team game. It's not about professional Christians. Plan A, all of us, if we want Tampa to change, if we want our job sites to change, if we want our families to change, if we want our neighborhoods to be different, we're all going in. It's every one of us. That's plan A. There is no plan B. It's what God did first for us, and so it's also what we now do in response. I'm going to pray for us now, and then we're going to do something else that is really special this morning that connects to how it is that we can be light in the world on behalf of Jesus. Please pray with me. Gracious God, we want to be risk takers. We want to be game players. We do not want to train and train and train and always get more and more for ourselves. It's not so much about who I am. It's a whole lot more about who you are. Gracious God, I want us to be a family. And I want this family to get bigger. I want it to be crowded because we've gone out there and we've loved well on your behalf and more people have come back in here. How did they get here? Well, I watched them care about them. That's who we want to be, gracious God. It costs you a lot. This is not easy. There's risk. Jesus, is. you are on the move, and I want to be with you. We want to be with you. We will fight, gracious God, for relationships. We will fight when it's fun. We'll fight when it hurts. We'll fight when it's challenging. We'll fight when it's a celebration. But that's what we're about. We're people who are good friends who also have something to say. Gracious God, we want to remember that it's not our job to be perfect in our relationships. It's our job to be present. We want to be there when people are struggling. We want to be be there when people are having a great time. We want to be there when people need our help, our shoulder. We want to be there the same way that you sent yourself into our lives. That's who we want to be, gracious God. Make us into your sons and daughters secure in knowing that we are loved and made over again by you so that we can go into your world and be people, gracious God, who you use to love others. We want to be a part of a rescue mission. And so we pause now, each of us, and we ask the question, have I ever surrendered? Have I ever discovered a relationship with Jesus? And maybe, gracious God, in the spirit of prayer, there's someone in this room right now who hasn't. And maybe they want to do that right now. If you are one of those persons, and if that's happening with you right now, please tell somebody, please tell me, just anybody. Anybody who you know will just love you and help you take the next step. And gracious God, for others who are in this room who who are followers of you right now, each of us, also, I'm just going to stop and say, who is it, Almighty God, who right now today you want me to leave my place and go into their world relationally and build a bridge? Who comes to mind right now? We pause now just for a few seconds to ask you to give us somebody that we can love, be a friend to on behalf of you. Thank you, gracious God, that you will use us to help make life different for people. We want to be a part of life-changing relationships in our families, in our jobs, in our neighborhoods, out in the world that we live in. Send us. 
Give us the courage to take a risk. Help us to not worry about getting everything right. We can simply, be, by being there, we will be not so much right, but more like being bright. In Jesus' name, amen. So I'm stepping down now to do this special thing. And what we're doing here is this. We're going to remember people who were a part of our lives who are no longer with us. And what will happen is you're going to experience the emotion of that. You're going you're to probably experience the emotion of loss. But here's what I wanted to say to you. Allow yourself to see it as an opportunity to surrender to the goodness of God. But also I want to say this, just exactly what I just said for the last minutes. It's very likely that if you are in the process of letting God be in your life where you hurt, God will help you help someone else who is hurting. This will be one of the bridges that God will help you as you're sent out in the world. I promise you, people who've been hurt and experienced brokenness and who somehow managed to let that be a part of their fabric of their relationship with Jesus Christ, oh, you become a wounded healer. And God can't wait to let your wounds that are healing be an avenue and a venue and an opportunity to someone else's healing. Perhaps God will use your hurt inside to be the first step that someone else takes into a relationship, a life-changing relationship with Jesus. So we invite you to just come forward, and what, what you need to know is that as you come forward, we're praying for you, and we want to give you the opportunity to take one of these matches, use a lit candle, and then light a candle in memory of and remembrance or honor of the loved one who is no longer here with you. If you would like, I'll also have a mic for you to say the name of that person. And uh, if you're not comfortable saying the name, you can whisper it to me and I will say their name for you. So we invite you to come forward in faith, trusting them into God's loving care and trusting your own heart into his care.
For Betty. For all of our grandparents and my good friend uh, Patrick Wilcox. For Susan's mother, Carolyn Welch. Uncle Bob. So we heard the very familiar melody of O Holy Night. It was a holy night. It's a, it's a reflection on the incarnation that God became one of us and took the risk to offer us a loving relationship with him. And you and I, as people who've been hurt, God will use that hurt in our healing as a way to love other people, perhaps people who are hurting right now. All of this is the goodness of Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. We celebrate, we recognize sadness, all of it, and everything in between. It's a part of how God makes us into whole new people, a part of how God wants to use us. Do this. Stand now. We're going to sing with joy about the goodness of what it means to be loved so that we can become good lovers in the world.
before I send us, remember, we're going to go upstairs and be merry and bright with a bunch of kids, huh? This is the charge that we hear this morning. This is our, this is our sending, where we live, where we work, where we play, where we shop, where we study. Be bright. Do whatever it takes. All things to all people. Get out of here. 